speak on genetic vulnerability as well as treatments for opiate addiction. I'm going to touch on other addictive diseases. I am going to talk about molecular neurobiology because I think all physicians, psychiatrists, internists, and people involved in other areas need to build on their early training in physiology and in pathology and get increasingly into molecular biology. And those of us who work in the brain have to cope with the fact that it's the most difficult system of all, very intricate, very intertwined, and yet we're beginning to understand pieces of it. And Dr. Amati caught exactly the thrust of my laboratory work to look at the opioid system, the endorphins, including those that we like, the reward, and the opioids that we may not like so much, but that say, you've had enough chocolate, you've had enough strawberries, but don't always say you've had enough or too much cocaine, alcohol, or heroin. And that's what I'm going to cover today. So how big is the problem in my country, the United States, well, it is quite horrific, thank you. It's extraordinarily high. We have over 16 million alcoholics defined by ICD or DSM-4 criteria. Five is not well understood by anyone, as you may have heard from your speaker yesterday. Uh, marijuana use, we have about six million that are dependent. Cocaine addiction, about three million. Heroin addiction, one million, and growing extremely rapidly. We have had a major problem over the last 15 years of overprescribing by physicians, by dentists, of opiate pain medications. Two weeks supply when one day would suffice for trauma, for post-operative care, for root canal work. And this has led to the availability in medicine cabinets. I don't know about Italy, but in US, people put their medicines in little cabinets in the bathroom, and the kids can take what the parents didn't take as part of their prescribed medicine. However, opiate prescription medicines are so very expensive, eight to 40 US dollars on the street, that when those run out, the youngsters are turning to heroin, which in New York City, two blocks from my university, is $2.50. So you see the economic impact as well. It is cheaper to buy heroin than it is to buy a candy bar, a piece of fruit, or to go to the movies. And this plays a role in the acquisition of addictions. Thank you, Dr. Antoine. Now, what are the factors that contribute to the development of addictive diseases? And I like to just use a charade in my Venn diagram, you shall see on the right environmental factors. And of those, stress, a typical responsivity to stress, plays a very large role, as does peer pressure, as does prenatal and perinatal events, which we now call epigenetics. There has to be use of the drug or alcohol before addiction can ensue. But there's also genetic factors, and these genetic factors include not a single gene, but multiple variants of multiple genes that acting together will increase or decrease the vulnerability to develop an addictive disease. All these act together 
genes, environment, and the culprit, the culprit being drug or alcohol. The same diagram could be built for an infectious disease with the drug substituted with some bug, like the Zika virus, or the same diagram could be used for hypertension with too much salt, diabetes, too much sugar. We have in all medicine today complex disorders with multiple genes contributing multiple variants, environmental factors, and in this case, drug-induced factors. So a psychiatrist today needs to learn that we have to treat with our excellent skills in talk therapy, with our excellent skills in pharmacotherapy using the correct medication for any one disorder and using adequate amount of that medication. And we also have to uh, use integrated care. And for that, you may need a counselor or psychologist to assist in the work. Now, many years ago, my laboratory started working with human molecular genetics before it became as easy, relatively speaking, as it is now. That is, we had to make gels. And there are three or four young people in the room, I'm sure, or not so young people, that have made gels to look at gene variants to discover them. And very early on, we looked at this gene. This is your mu opioid receptor against the upper black environment you will see where an opioid or an opiate binds, beta endorphin, heroin, morphine, methadone, buprenorphine. In the blue part, you see where signal transduction occurs, and the transmembrane region is this classical seven transmembrane receptor system. And you will understand that up in that external part, the N-terminus, I have pointed out in yellow two very common variants. C17T, very common in African Americans or African origin people, but very rare in Caucasians. On the other hand, the A118G, 10 to 25% of you in this room have this variant. 10 to 25% is quite common, and in Asian populations it's 50 to 60%, relevant possibly for your next speaker. And we hypothesized back in our first paper in the PNAS in 1998 that this 118G variant would probably be functional, which we went on to study, and I will show you it is functional, alter stress responsivity, which we didn't know a priori, but we could tell in our early studies. And this variant we went on to show is very strongly associated with opiate addiction, where the opiate addict wishes to hide from stress, and the alcoholic, where everyone wants to be with it, just as in cocaine, until they, of course, pass out. So we hypothesized that this gene, with its variants, would be important for physiology, therefore coined the term physiogenetics, to parallel the much earlier accepted term of pharmacogenetics, meaning altering drug metabolism. Natural history. I don't ask the question of senior professionals like you all, but I could and say how many have ever tried a drug or used alcohol. And the numbers are considerable, actually, in any group. Sporadic intermittent use, and alcohol, I would say, is almost the norm in Judeo-Christian tradition, Western tradition. Excess becomes the issue there. But most persons that try a drug such as heroin or cocaine even, an illicit drug, will stop after one or two attempts. Then some will become sporadic users, and for an illicit drug which has no redeeming feature, that's probably not a good idea. And we are, as many others are, working for vaccine development that might prevent, for instance, oxycodone abuse. And we are doing so with selectivity so it would not block the ability to receive pain medications later in life. I don't know that we'll get there. Sporadic users can become regular users. Regular users can go on to addiction. And as I pointed out early on, about one in 10 become addicted to alcohol or to cocaine or to marijuana after self-exposure. About one in four become addicted to opiates, much higher percentage. And as was said in the introduction by Dr. Amari, 
Addictions include compulsive behavior, and that compulsive behavior is one of drug seeking, drug taking, despite knowledge of negative consequences to self and others. Now this is the 50th anniversary of our first scientific paper from the Rockefeller University describing methadone maintenance treatment. The pictures you see there are me when I was a small girl. Not exactly. Professor Dole on the left, the late Marie Nicewander in the middle, myself on the right. We formed a three-person team, and the very first thing we did was to find addiction slightly differently, that heroin addiction, and I now could extend this to any addiction, is a disease, a metabolic disease of the brain with resultant behaviors. The behaviors of drug hunger which lead to drug seeking compulsively, as I've already said, and drug self-administration. And that heroin addiction is not simply a criminal behavior and cannot be treated as such, nor is it simply a single antisocial personality disorder, much more complex. We have people with bipolar disease, with unipolar depression, anxiety. 50% have comorbidity with any addiction. And 50% don't. They would seem to be otherwise very healthy people, but who become addicted. Now, in our very first work with methadone maintenance treatment, we, on the left, described what a heroin addict looks like in the upper left panel. On off, on off, on off. Short acting heroin requiring three to six administrations a day. In the lower left panel, we drew a picture of what it looked like when we started people on methadone treatment, 40 milligrams a day usually, and then slowly ascended that dose to blockading doses, doses which provided cross tolerance, which were 80, then 80 to 120 mg a day, now 80 to 150 mg a day. We then conducted studies shown with that H where we superimposed a short-acting narcotic like heroin or hydromorphone, or any other opiate drug. And we found that no high, no euphoria, no reward could be perceived against a blockading dose. But this is why it is essential not to use 20, 30, 40, or 50 mg a day of methadone. You have to use adequate doses, which as I say, many laboratories over 50 years have defined as being 80 to 150 a day. Stable, there's never a high, there's never a sleepiness if you ascend that dose slowly, and there's no withdrawal. Later, when my lab and that of Interesi at Cornell developed the analytical techniques by 1973, we could find out that whereas the half-life of heroin is three minutes, it is a Bayer Company pro-drug created in the 1880s. It is rapidly biotransformed to monoacetyl morphine and monoacetylmorphine is very potent, acting at the mu receptor in a reward mode. But it's very short-lived, 30 minutes. And morphine itself, the next metabolite, has a half-life in its totality of four to six hours. So it's on-off, on-off, on-off. Euphoria, withdrawal, withdrawal. With euphoria, withdrawal. Methadone, conversely, for its mixed enantiomers used in medication throughout the world, including here in Italy, has a half-life of 24 hours, range from 20 to 30. And we went on to study the active enantiomer, and it has a half-life of 36 hours. There's some work going on yet again, 20 years ago in Germany, now again in England, using only the active half, uh, the early studies from Germany proved that it was not as effective as when you had the racemic and much more expensive. We will be watching for the new studies in the UK. How many people are currently in methadone maintenance treatment in US and worldwide? <clears throat> we currently have about 330,000 in daily methadone maintenance treatment in US. They progress from daily clinic visits to twice a week, to weekly, and then in many areas of the states, 
We have medical maintenance where patients are seen once every 30 days. Europe has about 600,000 in methadone maintenance treatment, and the rest of the world about 400,000. We know that the goals of a good methadone program uh, are to get retention in treatment and decreasing or eliminating use of heroin and other short-acting opiates. Voluntary retention for methadone is 30 to 80 percent for one year in an average program with no selection of subjects. Continuing use of heroin steps down with time. It's not magic, not a magic bullet, but with a combination of adequate counseling, psychiatry, psychology, or counseling, and adequate doses of methadone, 80 to 150 a day, one sees retention and decrement, and in most subjects, complete limitation of illicit opiate use. And the actions are preventing withdrawal symptoms, preventing drug hunger, blocking the euphoric effects of short-acting opiates like heroin, but extremely important, allowing normalization of physiology that's been disrupted. And that physiology is not just of the body outside the brain, it's the brain physiology. And my lab and many others using rodent models have begun to show what is altered what can be normalized with steady days methadone. And you have to put, if you do rat or mouse studies like we do, you have to put it in by pump because methadone is extremely short acting in rodents. We know why it doesn't bind to plasma proteins, but you have to put it in by pump to model. Be very careful of some of the literature where the scientists didn't know that. The mechanism, methadone is a full mu opioid receptor agonist. That means with every dose you give, you get a greater effect. It acts like endorphins in that once it binds to the mu opioid receptor, it rapidly internalizes, allowing the receptor to represent and preventing rapid development of tolerance. So we've had patients on the same dose of methadone for up to 50 years. I have a few patients in 45-year follow-up. It also acts as a very modest NMDA receptor antagonist. Now, we have in the US now some 1,200 facilities offering methadone maintenance. We have 330,000 patients in treatment. Unlike Italy, where access is quite good to methadone and buprenorphine naloxone, access to methadone treatment programs in the US is highly limited because of bureaucratic laws acted by Congress in 73, amended, last amended in 1984, despite arguments from the Academy of Sciences, of which I was part of the argument in the mid-90s and subsequently to change those regulations to allow greater access. Buprenorphine, on the other hand, has no limitation, really none, other than meeting the diagnosis of dependence. We have some 3,000 physicians or small groups that offer buprenorphine treatment and about 48,000 patients in treatment. The biggest problem in US, and it's really beginning to look like France and Spain, is that there's no access to counseling or psychiatric. There's no requisite access. Many patients simply take the medication when they will and then don't take it other days. So this is, I think, a flaw, and I commend you read the papers from Sweden where they have a simple set of specialty clinics, psychiatrists, internists working together. Patients are started either on buprenorphine naloxone or on methadone. The majority will start on buprenorphine meth naloxone, the combination, of course, to prevent intravenous abuse, but then uh, they find that many have very severe dependence and they must go to methadone maintenance treatment. And that is not a problem because one resource working with the general practitioners is able to offer whichever. And at the end of one year, two papers have been done on two different years block after this new treatment design was developed about eight years ago. 65% end up in long-term, maybe lifelong as in U.S., methadone maintenance treatment, 80 to 150 megs a day, and about 35% end up 
in buprenorphine naloxone treatment, usually 24 mg. Very, very few people in US are extended release naltrexone. We had early studies, very expensive studies in the mid 80s of naltrexone daily administered for opiate addiction. Complete failure, the studies were deemed unethical and stopped because less than 15% came and stayed in treatment and responded. Why? It's exactly the opposite of what a person needs who has opiate addiction. I will show you, and you'll have to have a fair amount of belief systems because the time is limited. A relative endorphin deficiency develops during opiate addiction, during cocaine addiction, and you need to replace that relative endorphin deficiency. The way to do it is with a full agonist methadone or a partial agonist buprenorphine. And remember, the naloxone in buprenorphine is not felt or has no effect unless a person should try to misuse that buprenorphine by the intravenous route. In converse, naltrexone and nemaphine block the endorphins. Fine for alcoholism because there, stress there is sought, and both naltrexone and nemaphine cause activation of stress. I'm very proud to say that my trainees working in Macau and in Hong Kong and myself with other colleagues working in mainland China have now introduced methadone maintenance treatment in that part of Southeast Asia. I was in a meeting in Macau last April and they have 200,000 persons in treatment amongst the sites in mainland China. China plans to get that up to a half million within five years. And I laugh and say, it's the 50th anniversary of our first scientific paper, but knowing how wonderfully aggressive the Chinese are, I'm sure in another 10 years we'll find that methadone maintenance was developed in China. And that's fine. They have more need than any country in the world, but every country, including your own, needs access to long-term, adequate dose, adequate counseling treatment. So we have two excellent treatments for opiate addiction, methadone and buprenorphine. Buprenorphine effective in 40 to 50% of unselected persons. Naltrexone, both sustained release and daily, less than 15%. For alcoholism, we have naltrexone and nemaphine, US and Europe respectively, effective in those with the gene variant and a few more. A camprosate, not very effective in US, modestly effective in Europe, and many nicotine replacement treatments. Cocaine, amphetamines, we have absolutely nothing. And this is a cartoon in one of our papers, relatively recent in JCI, looking at the targets for treatment. And the targets are the mu receptor. Buprenorphine also has modest kappa partial agonism, which may be why it's particularly effective in some. Methadone is a pure agonist with a little bit of NMDA antagonism. And um, buprenorphine has a very, very tiny action at the nociceptin receptor. That is the opiate-like but non-opioid receptor. Now, what are the big players in development of any addiction? They are dopamine, the mu opioid receptor endorphins, and countermodulatory are the dynorphins. This I will ask, how many of you like chocolate? Not as bad as U.S. Do a lot of you like chocolate, chocolate candy? How many like raspberries? A lot of raspberries. I'm with you guys. Now, if you're given a pint of raspberries in a room by yourself, I can eat the whole pint. But you usually stop. And why do you stop? It is because the dynorphin says you've had enough, your dopamine has gone up, you love raspberries. You think about raspberries and your dopamine goes up. For a narcotic addict, they think about opiates, their dopamine starts up immediately. Same with cocaine addict, same with alcohol. The dopamine begins to surge with anticipation. Well, you all know as psychiatrists, anticipation is extremely important. But then it surges much more and can be measured in rodent models with microdialysis once a drug is given. And it's a potent rise with opiates and with cocaine. And then the dynorphin will jump in, act at the cap receptors to countermodulate. Now this is cocaine in little animals given a binge pattern, little mice by Young John in my group. And you look at the upper pink bar, light pink, and you'll see in two different strains of mice, 
the one all of us study, C57s, and the one on the right that gives us knockout mice potential. And you'll see that pink, you get a binge. Each binge, the dopamine surges as measured quantitatively. 13 days later, you see the deep pink surge, yes, after every dose. But two things you note. The baseline is much lower. So they're developing a relative dopamine deficiency, which you all know from psychiatry is dysphoric or depressive causing. And although the surge occurs, you go down to that low baseline. Every dose will give activity activation in the normal mouse. The other strain of mice, not so. So this is why when you do knockout mice or other kind of genetically modified mice, you have to go breed the animals to a background that's like the normal mice. Now, if you give cocaine on a binge pattern for 14 days, you also see first the mu opioid receptor gene expression go up, and then, as you see in these brain slices from a mouse, or this is from the rat, increase mu receptors shown in red in the dorsal striatum, memory, learning, caudate, and putamen, the ventral striatum, nucleus accumbens, which is involved in reward, and in the amygdala, involved in emotion and fear. And further, if you stop that cocaine and wait two weeks, you see that this does not go back to normal. And we can look longer, and it still does not go back to normal. The same happens with opiates. The brain changes, but when you stop the drug, it does not go back to normal. And this is why people in abstinence-based residential communities for six months or one year come out and relapse immediately. And that's 90% of all long-term opiate addicts. Cocaine addiction, you can get about a 40% recovery weight, abstinence-based, without pharmacotherapy, which is fortunate since we don't have a pharmacotherapy. With opiate addiction, less than 10% will stay opiate-free or other drug-free. And that's very, very sobering to use the word correctly. Countermodulation with cocaine, again, binge pattern, you'll see the gene expression of dynorphin go up, and you see again shown in red, the kappa opioid receptors go up. But unlike with the mu receptor, where you saw no increase in beta endorphin, a relative endorphin deficiency develops, you see with the kappa that persists with an increase in dynorphin peptide as well as receptor, leading to depressive symptoms, feeling of uncomfortableness, which urges the person to go on and use the opiate shown here. Opiates do the same thing cocaine does, made the dynorphin surge, the kappa receptor surge, and this persists. We know if you put dynorphin into a little mouse freely moving, undergoing microdialysis, as shown on the left four different doses of dynorphin, you lower the dopaminergic tone. And on the right, purple is a single dose of cocaine. Red is that single dose of cocaine coupled with a high dose of dynorphin. So you can actually prevent the surge with dynorphin. Yet the dynorphin can cause some dysphoria. Stress. Throw a rat or mouse into a cold water pool. It does not like it. It becomes immobile. It stops swimming and will drown if you don't rescue it. You can rescue it with a dopamine antagonist, a kappa opioid receptor antagonist, such as Norby and I, shown in the right here. But the gene expression at dynorphin goes up, and my lab has shown this is due both to epigenetic changes and to classical transacting molecular changes. Stress responsivity. Every one of you humans, we have all mammals, two drivers of our HPA axis. They are CRF and the oft-forgotten arginine vasopressin. They act at two different receptors at the anterior pituitary to drive the processing and release of proopio melanocortin, which yields both beta endorphin and ACTH. This drives cortisol to go up, Normal circadian rhythm, up in the morning for humans, night for rodents, 
down by evening of CRF, ACTH, beta endorphin, and cortisol. We learned early on that the endogenous opioids, the mu opioids, also regulate the stress axis and inhibit this axis, and the kappa system may activate this axis. So again, these two potent opioids play a direct role. And we found in our human studies that acutely and chronically short-acting opiates, like heroin, like morphine, suppress the HPA axis. That is why worldwide, the finest pain specialists want to use sustained release or long-acting, such as methadone treatment for treatment of pain. Not on-off. On-off will cause stress changes. It will cause much more problems with tolerance, dependence, and withdrawal, and lowers the HPA axis. Opiate withdrawal causes activation of the HPA axis. Cocaine and alcohol both activate this axis. And in long-term methadone maintenance, we see normalization. Well, here's a cartoon of, it's a drawing, actually, of data from healthy volunteers receiving either naloxone given intravenously, shown in gray, or nemaphene given intravenously, shown in green. And you will see that both of these cause profound activation of the HP axis with ACTH going up and CORT going up. Very important. This is what the alcoholics like, but the heroin addicts do not like at all. And we look at the structures of these four compounds, naloxone, naltrexone, nemaphene, buprenorphine, they're essentially identical. And they share mu opioid receptor action. Buprenorphine is the only mu agonist or partial agonist. All of them have some kappa opioid receptor activity, which looking to the future, when I come back in 10 years, I hope to be able to tell you that we have developed a kappa partial agonist. Nemaphene is a kappa partial agonist. I talked to the people from Lindbeck. They're vaguely aware of this fact. We have studied it extensively in my lab. But this is probably a very good thing and could be exploited. We think that this kappa system will be the next therapeutic target for alcoholism, for cocaine dependency, and for mixed dependency, because one could use a kappa partial agonist in combination with methadone maintenance or buprenorphine maintenance treatment for dependency. Now, the genetics. I touched on this ever so briefly before, but the same cartoon I'm showing you again, the mu opioid receptor with this A118G variant. Well, I'm going to bore you with some basic bench molecular pharmacology. Orange is the mutant receptor transfected by us into proper cells of two different kinds. Blue is the prototype receptor. You'll notice orange sits to the left of blue in both cartoons. The left side is binding. So the A118G receptor binds beta endorphin three times more tightly than the prototype. And do remember, one in five of you have a copy of this, and it happens with a single copy. Also, the orange variant will cause threefold greater signal transduction. Now, we've hypothesized that this would alter stress responsivity in healthy humans. And you'll see here on the left panel, green is people with one or two copies of the G, A118G variant. Uh, yellow is a prototype, and you'll see the baseline cortisol levels are modestly higher, not outside normal range. And you'll see on the right-hand side work from Gary Wand and Hank Kranzler and others, also our own group. Green is when people are given naloxone or naltrexone who have one or two copies of this variant. Yellow is when they are the prototype. And you'll see a much greater activation this is going to be psychiatry, medical science of the future, looking at the specific functionalities of gene variants that are found to be functional. Going on. O'Brien with Kranzler re-invited their subjects that had been in naltrexone trial for alcoholism, and they did genotyping of those that consented. About one in six came in and consented. The white curve 
are the people that did very well on naltrexone treatment. They are people with one or two copies of the G variant and who receive naltrexone. The others are people without the variant or receiving placebo. The study was repeated by Goldman at MIAAA along with others. And what they found again, as shown in the yellow on the right, people with one or two copies of the variant receiving naltrexone responded incredibly well to naltrexone treatment. Didn't even require as much counseling. I hate to say that always, but because I like to see counseling or psychiatric care along with medications, but there it is. And we went to Sweden, to Stockholm, where I have an adjunct appointment at Karlinska, and working with Heilig, who then was there, he's now back in Sweden, parenthetically, after a decade in the US. And we found that, as shown in the upper half, that the G variant is very strongly associated with opiate addiction, both in Swedes with only Swedish heritage, and in the 20% who have, along with everyone else, who have mixed heritage. And in fact, the relative risk was extraordinarily high, 18% increase in relative risk if you had one copy of that G variant for developing opiate addiction. And in the lower half, a second study conducted with the Karolinska group that was with alcoholics. And again, we showed a very, very strong association with alcoholism. And remember, alcoholics like activation of this stress axis and opiate addicts hate it. So it was not surprising to me. I hypothesized we'd see both of these. Now, this is very new data from my lab. It's bench data. These are little mice, but they've been very elegantly gene transformed by a colleague down at University of Pennsylvania, Julie Blendy, and she working with Jung Jean and my group and others, have taken the mice, the green line is the mutant mice, those with the G change, a nucleotide change, which results in the same amino acid change, asparagine to aspartic acid, at the 112 position of the N-terminus in the mouse, at the 118 position of the N-terminus in humans. It's an analogous position, and no extra human genetic material was left in. Only that one nucleotide was changed, resulting in a change, profound change, same as we have in human A1HEG, of that one amino acid, which changes structure. And then both the male and female animals were allowed to self-administer heroin for 10 days, four hours a day in a mouse model. And I think the picture speaks for itself. One amino acid change resulted in twice as much heroin self-administration in these mice, twice as much. And this, in fact, is the answer when people say, oh, I don't think opiate addiction or other addictions have a genetic basis. There it is, right there. And we went on to ask about what happens to dopamine. Green is the variant, yellow is the prototype. Dose of heroin times two causes a much greater activation of dopamine, the dopamine surge that I taught you about, than it does in the prototype. Greater dopamine, greater self-administration. The dynorphin gene. Well, Vadim Yufarov, a former Russian-American in my lab, has really redefined the whole human pro-dynorphin gene and elegant work that's accepted worldwide. This side of the gene, the promoter region, there's a 68 base pair repeat. Every one of you have one, up to five copies from your mother and from your father. So you can from two copies to 10 copies. On the right-hand side in green, we have also gene variants. My lab and the lab of O'Brien Berrettini have shown the left-hand side is in fact associated with alcoholism and cocaine dependency, and the right-hand side similarly with alcoholism and cocaine dependency. And we have gone on to look at this and other variants in healthy human brains that have died accidental death and had post-mortem and had genotyping. And you'll see here that the genotype dictates the amount of gene expression of dynorphin. We see in the caudate putamen region, the dorsal striatum, memory and learning, remember, of the human brain. We give dynorphin peripherally to healthy humans 
And because our blood-brain barrier is different than rodents, prolactin release can be used as a biomarker lowering dopaminergic tone in the tuba and fundibular dopaminergic region causes prolactin release. As psychiatrists, you know some serotonergic drugs do this. But here we are with dopamine lowered by the dynorphin, as I showed you in the rodent model, and we are using that as a tool. We've gone on to look at that promoter region 68 base pair repeat with a French colleague, and she has working in my lab shown that fewer copies of that repeat give more dynorphin and therefore become protective against cocaine addiction or alcoholism. And this is a study that our lab did, a very similar study published by Berrettini at UPenn. Then we've also looked at just healthy humans, like everyone here. And all of you fit into either the LL, SL, or SS. Your baseline levels, when you wake up in the morning at prolactin, are dependent on how many copies of the 68 base pair you have. If you're a male, females, we are so different. Our prolactin is always higher and it bounces like a rubber ball. So all bets are off with females, but that's often true. But with males, very predictable. And look, those error bars are quite tight. So we can predict by your genetics what your prolactin level will be. Now, we also know that, as I've already alluded to, ethnic groups are profoundly different. So we do what we call ancestral informity markers in all of our genetics work. AIMS markers do not read a paper seriously that mixes Caucasians, Africans, and Asians. It's just meaningless. And we do this on every single subject. And we arbitrarily accept either 50% of one ethnic culture group or 70%, depending on how rigid we can afford to be with a population we have under study. And you will see when we looked at those gene variants that my lab has found to be associated with opiate addiction, and there are over 80 of them now. They were very different in the European ancestry group versus the African ancestry group. Only 12 were shared, and intriguingly, two of those 12 were functional variants of the dopamine D2 receptor, again, where dopamine acts. We have published now many different associations of genes that are involved in each of these different systems, serotonergic, abergic, dopaminergic, cholinergic, adrenergic, and then more generally stress, signal transduction, circadian rhythm. And we have found that some of these variants are associated with both cocaine addiction and opiate addiction such as this AVP, arginine vasopressin, which drives that stress axis, the HPA axis, and such as the receptor for corticotropin releasing factor, anterior pituitary arginine. And we have found that galanin is also extremely important, studied extensively by Hochfeld at the Karolinska. We also are very pleased and somewhat humbled by the fact with rather small numbers of subjects, but very well phenotyped. And I really urge you as psychiatrists studying schizophrenia, bipolar, unipolar, please do not have all schizophrenics, all the best people, in one pile for genetic studies. It becomes meaningless. It's like all diabetics, all hypertensives, or if we said all addictions or all cancers, nonsense. We have to be much more precise. And we think it's our precision and phenotyping. We have a four hour to six hour ascertainment, which is very rigorous. And we think it's because of that, because everyone now has good molecular skills, that we have been able to find that these variants, which have been replicated by many other groups, and they include the mu, the kappa, and also the delta receptor involved in depression, I haven't discussed that today, and dynorphin of the opioid system. And it includes the AVP, a chaperone of cortisone, galanine, which I've discussed, and many others of different systems. And very importantly, and to end today, we've gone on to show circadian rhythm, very important for many psychiatric diseases, is controlled in large part by casein kinase 1 epsilon. There's a variant there that profoundly alters circadian rhythm. 
this chaperone that takes things in and out of the steroid receptors to change gene expression. And then important for those of you offering methadone maintenance treatment, we have defined that the CYP2B6 SNPs, in fact, are profoundly altering the dose of methadone required. These are all what you would call proper doses, 80 to 150, but with different combinations of the variants, you require a higher dose, a medium dose, or a low dose. And our work corroborates the very early and elegant work from Laosan and Geneva of Dr. Eep, methadone maintenance treatment, but now with genetics applied rigorously. And we have gone on to identify, very importantly, I think, we have P glycoproteins, which carry many things, but including medications, in and out of our brain. And we have identified a very important variant of the ABCDB1 glycoprotein, which is also called the multiple drug resistant gene 1. And we have found that, again, the presence or absence of this will dictate whether a person requires more than 100 milligrams a day or less than 100 milligrams a day if methadone is used in maintenance treatment. We work closely with clinics that we have either been directly affiliated, both of which have now closed at Cornell and Mount Sinai, which is a tragedy in a time of an opiate disaster in US. We need more excellent treatment programs. They need to be associated with academicians like many of you all are, and as well as in the community with consortiums so that the academics can teach and help the young psychiatrists or internists offer proper treatment. It's very essential. And it's going to get more complicated and yet more simple. We're blessed with opiate addiction. We have two medications that work and work well and work long term and are safe with no side effects after 20, 30, 40. We've studied up to 30 years, but I just will tell you I see patients in more than 30 years methadone maintenance treatment and more than 20 years buprenorphine naloxone treatment. They are fine, thank you. They come off treatment. A few do well. It's less than 15% even after long-term treatment. What we think is the brain was slightly abnormal to begin with on a genetic basis, becomes more abnormal with a drug insult, and takes a very long time, if ever, to heal. I thank you. <laughs>